Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode seven of the Addiction Help Podcast, where we discuss the latest in news, sports, and entertainment as it pertains to addiction, addiction recovery, and mental health. As always, I am your host, Dan Hauser. With me today, as always, as well, is my co-host, Jessica Miller, editorial director of addictionhelp.com. Hi, Jess. And since it's a Friday when we're recording this, happy Friday. Oh, my gosh. Happy Friday. I plan on spending the entire weekend playing uh, the new Zelda game, Tears of the Kingdom. So I don't know if anyone else listening has been playing, but. I have no clue what that means, but I'm sure somebody out there does. So. <laughs> it's so good. Dan and I like to tease each other about our like our fandoms because Dan's very into sports and I don't really know anything about sports. And I'm very into nerd culture. And Dan's like, eh, you know, I appreciate that for you, but well, I don't really know anything about it. So you can relate to this one a little bit, you know, to break the fourth wall. We're recording this on Friday. Last night was game one of the Eastern Conference finals with the Panthers. And uh, the game went four overtimes. That's it was about 10 that. seconds away from going five overtimes. So the game didn't end around until around 2 a.m. So you can relate to the fact that I had a late night last night. I was up until about two, oh uh, a little bit later gosh. than that. And so uh, regardless so of the, the Panthers are. That's football, hockey. right? Hockey. Uh, no, no, that is hockey. <laughs> we are not in football season yet. But uh, you can relate to the nerddom of life uh, uh, bringing us late into the night as far as, you know, staying up all night to do nerd, nerdy things. Yes. Mine just happens to be sports nerdy things. So. Heck yeah. Okay, but anyway. <laughs> but yes, anyway, exactly. So uh, today's episode is going to be a little bit of a unique one. Um, whereas in previous episodes, we've tended to kind of be all over the place with our topics and we've hit multiple things at once today. We're going to kind of hone in on one topic and that is going to be fentanyl, uh, and fentanyl awareness in honor of the fact that on May 9th, a couple weeks ago was fentanyl awareness day. So once again, really quickly, before we get into the start of the show, just a friendly reminder for everyone, like subscribe, rate, review, follow leave us notes, leave us reviews, leave us questions. Last week's episode was super fun. I had a ton of fun with that Q&A, so please, everyone, um, keep those questions coming. Absolutely. Um, that was a lot of fun. And as we get going today, you'll notice as we get going into today's show, there's going to be a little uh, listener interaction segment. So uh, you'll be able to participate with us uh, kind of in real time. So that'll be a fun thing for you guys to do as well. And we will uh, explain that a little bit more when we get to that point of the show. But to get us started off right away, um, let's just get right into the meat of uh, pretty much fentanyl and what it is, Jess, if you want to kind of kick us off, because this was actually your idea as far as uh, the topic for today because of uh, May 9th being Fentanyl Awareness Day. So for those of you who don't know, uh, fentanyl it has, there's two legal, or two legal, there's two forms of it. Uh, legal fentanyl and illicit or illegal fentanyl. Um, legally, fentanyl, actually, it's made as a prescription painkiller. It's very, very potent. Um, it's typically prescribed to people who have like chronic pain, severe pain, um, you know, post-surgery or if you've been in a bad accident, uh, cancer patient, things like that. So like it is medically used for people who are experiencing intense or very long-term pain. Um, the illicit form of it is made, it's like, it's technically made in labs, but we use that term very loosely because we don't, we don't want to portray like this pristine, good environment. It's kind of like meth labs, right? Like they're not, they're not really labs. They're Pic like picture breaking bad, these, but instead of meth, it's with illicit fentanyl basically. Yeah. Like, and, you know, nothing's being regulated and you know, who knows? So it's, um, it's being made illegally and it's either being created like like they'll make uh, fake fentanyl they'll add it to fake other opioid pills or they um like drug distributors have added it to other products most commonly like cocaine mass ecstasy just to increase the like the level of of addiction potentially potential what that can happen and from it to keep customers coming back it also gives you quote unquote more bang for the for the buck because you're using sure. less pure cocaine so it makes it cheaper to produce it's giving people just as much if not more of a high um so you can right. still charge as as the as the distributor or the dealer you can still charge essentially 
the same amount as you are charging for 100% pure cocaine, but you're only having to use maybe 50% of the actual pure cocaine. So you're able to make more money. Right. And like you mentioned, the user is getting um, their high that they still want out of it, sometimes to a detrimental or even deathly effect. They only oh, need ahead. like a tiny little about amount too to add so because uh, fentanyl is so, so potent. And then you run the risk of like, okay, well, if they're adding this and they only need a little bit, it's so much easier for people to overdose than they realize. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, with illicit fentanyl as opposed to the legal version that's given by via prescription, uh, illicit fentanyl is typically trafficked or distributed by the kilogram. And so for those of you at home that might be trying to kind of picture this in your head, essentially one kilogram of fentanyl can kill 500,000 people. It, it has the potency. Million. Yeah. So when you think of a kilogram, if you want to think of it in the sense of a literal sense of people, basically that one kilogram has the potential to kill a half a million people because of how strong it is and how dangerous it is. And, and it's being distributed by the kilogram, not like one at a time, like kilograms, uh, plural. And each kilogram is half a million people. So no, that's absolutely. why we're talking and, about it today. Yeah, yeah. And it also, you know, tying back to previous episodes, it's also another reminder of the importance of Narcan and having Narcan readily available and on you. We talked about that in a previous episode. When we talked about uh, how Narcan will soon First be able one. to be sold. The first, yeah, how it will soon be able to be sold over the counter. All the more reason why, even if you aren't somebody who uh, uses illicit substances yourself or has somebody in your family that does, it's it, it it might be beneficial or couldn't hurt, so to say, to just have it on you. Because once again, we like to remind everyone that good Samaritan laws uh, prevent you from getting into any sort of trouble if you happen to come across somebody experiencing an overdose episode and you try to help them. You're under no there, you, there's no legal ramifications on your end if something you know bad were to happen or they wouldn't come out of it. So it's it literally it's just another reminder that Narcan is so important. And also, once again, as we seem to talk about every week, um, you can't get the help you need if you are not alive. So once again, that goes ties back to Narcan. Also ties back to something interesting, Jess, that I know you and I have discussed, and you specifically have made a point to bring up, especially when we talked about that music festival episode, uh, and that is testing strips and t testing for what you're using in general. So you know, once again, we don't condone using illicit substances, right. but at the same time, we know that if you want to do it bad enough, there's nothing going to prevent you from doing it. And like I just said, you can't get the help you need if you're not alive. So testing strips can be something that can be very valuable when it comes to fentanyl because you need to you you want to make sure you know what you're taking uh, before you take it. Right. Like for instance, the reality is people are going to experiment. People are are going to do things. And again, as an organization, we obviously aren't condoning it, but we're not we're not going to condemn you for your choices. And it's it's far better for you to test. If you're buying the same weed or legally, test it and make sure you know what's in it and you know what you're getting because one mistake with a permanent consequence can prevent you from, you know, I mean, from getting help from, from anything. Even people out there that are just like experimenting, you know, fall victim to peer pressure. It happens. Just be safe. Be smart. Be safe. And it's important to tying back into Narcan for a minute as well too. Uh, whether it is yourself, a family member, somebody you happen to just be walking walking by on the street, um, it is at important. At a festival, who knows? Yeah, at a festival. It's important to know the signs to look out for if somebody might be uh, experiencing a fentanyl-related overdose. And also it's important to know what to do if you spot those signs. So first off, just a few quick uh, signs that somebody might be experiencing a fentanyl or opioid related overdose. Uh, their breathing might be slowed or stopped entirely. Uh, their heart rate might be slowed or stopped entirely. Now that's something that you might, wouldn't be able to see from the outside, but if you're the one experiencing it, if you notice that your your heart rate is, is incredibly slowing down, uh, that's something to be on the lookout for. 
uh, blue around right. the lips or, if you or check the finger. The person's pulse and they yes. have a well, pulse. Well, of course, and it's, of it's course, very yes, slow you, that you or, can do or weak. You know, yes. No, of course. But I'm just saying something that you would just see from the naked eye. You'd actually have to get up there and, right. and, and right. te test their pulse. But uh, if you notice that their lips or fingertips are turning blue or are blue, that's another sign. Obviously, of course, um, the easiest one to spot is if they appear to, appear to be passed out or non-responsive, or you try to awaken them and they can't. They they you can't awaken them. Uh, that's obviously another uh, pretty fairly easy sign to spot. So in that case, per the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, they have laid out very specific, very easy to follow steps that if you come across anyone that you suspect is having an overdose for any type of substance, whether it is alcohol, fentanyl, opioids, anything, obviously the first thing they tell you to do, and this is goes for anything Anytime anyone might be in any distress of any kind, obviously the first thing you always do is you always call 911 first because you need to get those first responders yes. alerted and, and on you know, their way. If, if you're not the one calling 911, you know, if you're there with people, don't shout out. They recommend not shouting out, hey, someone call 911. Point to someone and say, you call 911 because in a moment of panic like that, everyone potentially thinks that someone else is being the one calling. So if you point and say, you, call 911 while you're doing the, the next steps on this list, that's what's recommended. I just wanted to throw that out there. No, of course. Yeah, because I mean, I, I think that naturally all of us can relate to the assumption of if you're in a crowded room and somebody just yells out, hey, somebody do something, everyone's natural instinct is going to be like, oh, well, the, the, the other person's going to do that. So I don't need to do that. And then everybody thinks that nobody actually does it so yes absolutely no one's calling right right yeah. and it's and it's not anything because they're being mean or they don't want to it's just because naturally our assumption is that in a, in a general statement like that with a lot of people around everyone just kind of assumes, well somebody will do it and then if everyone has that assumption then it doesn't end up getting done right it's a very distracting environment there's a lot happening You're, a lot of chaos you know, yeah. distracted and yeah it's hard to think clearly anyway so yeah best to choose someone tell them you call 911 and then you go with the next steps. What are the steps, Dan? Absolutely. So, so after that, um, the, 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 the rest of the steps are basically just preventative things you can do to help the person while you wait for first, responder to, first responders to arrive. Um, obviously, if you have Narcan available, after you call 911, that would then be the time to administer it, uh, especially if they are unresponsive and not uh, breathing, because obviously you need to... to right get them breathing in and start to reverse those overdose effects. So the um, first responders Narcan can come in. works on opioids. Yes. Yes. Of course. So the, right now we're talking specifically for you. opioids. Right. It will not hurt you if, if they have taken something on top of the opio opioids or if you are mistaken and they've not actually taken fentanyl or another opioid, it's not going to hurt them. It's just not going to do anything. So once, um, once after you've administered the Narcan, assuming it's an opioid-related overdose, whether the Narcan helped uh, reawaken them and get them breathing again, or they already have been awake and breathing, uh, the next key is to keep them awake and breathing. You don't want them to, quote-unquote, go to sleep or pass out uh, be or because it could essentially slow their breathing and they might not come out of it later. Uh, another thing the CDC recommends is that if the person is laying on their back or they're not laying down at all to lay them on their side, because a lot, often if somebody is experiencing an overdose, they may uh, throw up or regurgitate something. And so if they're lying on their side, they can't choke on that. But if they're laying on their back there, you run the risk of them basically swallowing it or not, you know, in, and this in, is if they're, this is if they're not conscious, if they're conscious, yes, you know, yes. if you vomit when you're conscious, like that, you're you, okay you know, better. Yeah. That. this is if they're of course. right. Of course. You're well aware. <laughs> <laughs> and then the final step, of course, is to just be a good person and stay with them until the first res first responders arrive. Um, often the first responders will have questions. And so if you're there, you can provide them with the valuable answers that they might need so that they can better assist the person. Uh, once, you know, if you if you don't know the person, once first responders have arrived and you've answered any questions, you know, you're free at that point to go. I mean, really, if you know the person, too, you're free to go. But if you know the person, you might want to still hang around and stay with them a little bit longer just to make sure everything's OK. But, uh, yeah, just, you know, kind of just be a good, a nice person and just stay with them so they're not alone. And then so, of course, if the first responders have any questions, you can answer those as well. Jess, you had brought up a really good point in our kind of pre-production 
meeting about safely disposing fentanyl. So if you do f- mm. find yourself um, in a situation where you come across fentanyl or you test your substance and find out that there's fentanyl in it, and obviously then you do not want to proceed with taking it, there are uh, safe ways to dispose of it so that nobody else might make that same mistake. So Jess, if you just kind of want to um, yeah, quickly go over how, well, you know, even- some of the safe ways to do that. For people who have sentinel prescriptions, typically, um, in a lot of cases, it comes as a patch. And it's something that you wear. Uh, one of my relatives actually uses this. They actually need it for medical purposes. And, and it just it's just a little patch. It kind of looks the same as like a nicotine patch or something. And the medicine is slowly absorbed through the skin over time. Um, and once you take those off, you know, it's very important to fold them in half and seal it because you know, even that slight little bit of residue, like if, if you toss it in your trash, like, you know, a kid could get to it or an animal could get to it or whatever. You just want to be super careful. Um, while I was looking up the safe ways to dispose of fentanyl, it kind of, I think this is probably a good segue. Well, if it's not, it's too bad because we're segueing anyway. <laughs> but, uh, I, I saw a couple of things that were really interesting. So I had an idea that I wanted to do like a little quiz. And the first question is going to be about fentanyl safety. So uh, Dan has not seen any of these questions. He doesn't know what I've prepared. <laughs> I have not. Uh, um, we, share a, we share a Google Doc when we do our rundown. There is a um, very bold lettering that says, I have my own doc, do not click. <laughs> so I have not clicked. Dan, so for you listening click. at home, I, yes. have, I do not know the questions that are coming to me. I have not pre-prepared and looked up any answers. Also, tying back to the in- our, our intro, this is where you guys can come in, too. If you'd like to go ahead and play along at home with us, uh, you're more than welcome to do so. See if you can beat me and uh, share your results with <laughs> us, uh, especially if you get a higher <laughs> score than me. We'd love to know that you guys um, you know, are the fentanyl masters or experts when it comes to knowledge in, of, of fentanyl. All right. So the way I've done it, I've only got eight questions, but there are a couple of opportunities for bonus points. So you get a point for everything that you get right. And then if you don't get it right, you just don't get a point. So do you want to keep track of your score? Or should I? How do you want to do this? We didn't talk about this at all. Um, you, you can keep track of it. Just to keep everything on the up and up, I'll let you go. Since you, you all right. I know nothing on this, Trusty so we're go, I'm up. going into this completely uh, blind from the standpoint. Of, like I said, I have not prepared anything. I don't know what these questions coming at me are going to be. So we'll keep this all on the up and up and, and fair and for those watching, you can see that Jess literally just pulled a sticky note to start tracking <laughs> scores. Sticky note. It's uh, very fancy over here. Um, hey, listen. Okay. Nobody said so, whatever works. Nobody. I, I I have sticky notes all over the place in my office, and you know whatever works it's for you. True. But I anyway, if that's an ADHD thing, like sticky notes. Anyway, um, okay. So first question kind of ties into what we were just talking about, and this is a true or false question. So true or false, the safest way to dispose of fentanyl patches is to flush them down the toilet. I'm going to say false on that. The correct answer is true. <laughs> I started out with a really mean one. Didn't wow. I? Okay. So I just, I know that traditionally when it comes to prescription substances, they recommend that you return that. Well, I know you can't return a pharmacy, but a firehouse, uh, police stations, you know, something like that. And, and don't just flush it down the toilet. So that is very interesting that for fentanyl, is the exception to the rule on that one. So D- according to, and so for those of you listening too, we have sources for each of these that we're going to either list in the description or a comment after, depending on like the space we have for characters. So you can read about this yourself, but this is directly from the CDC website about disposal, safe disposal of prescription medication. And with the fentanyl patch, it literally says fentanyl strips should be flushed immediately. Use fentanyl strips. So once you've taken it off and you fold it in half, they don't even recommend putting it in your trash. They recommend flushing it down your toilet. I was stunned. I looked it up like all over and this is, yep, directly from the CDC. Well, folks, uh, Jess did not give me an easy one to get us started here. So there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was uh, like, it's a great segue from no. what we were talking about, but it's kind of mean. So and honestly, you know, I, I, I feel like I, I feel like I know my fair share of information, uh, just about substances in general, you know, with, with what we do, but, uh, that, 
I did. I had no clue on that, um, and so I'm guessing there are a lot Same. of people out there that also didn't. So I think that's really, really good that we uh, touched we, on that right yes. out of the gate. If somebody got this one right, I want to know. <laughs> yes, because I didn't. Whoever got this one right needs to tell us immediately because kudos to you for Please knowing. Please comment. That. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question. I think this is a little bit easier, and I think this this pertains to um, some of the facts that that uh, we had discussed. You know, because you've done writing for the site and stuff like that, so you might know this one. This is multiple choice. The CDC reports that 150 people die from synthetic opioid-related overdoses, which, you know, would include fentanyl, every hour, every day, every week, or every month. It's 150 every, people. Every day. Yep. I that have written enough about uh, synthetic opioids to <laughs> kind of have that one. I don't want to say memorize at this point, but, you know, when you see when you see really staggering statistics, it's hard sometimes to forget those. And yeah, 150 a day, that's pretty yes. crazy when you think about it. And, you know, to to be serious for a minute, like we're having fun and we're doing a quiz, but just to just pause and absorb, that's 150 moms, dads, brothers, cousins, like 150 human beings every single day. Every day. I, I want to say it's it's like every 11 minutes. So that'll be what, three people, two or three people just during the scope of this podcast, mathematically? Like, that's a and, lot. And, that's yeah, why we're Chris, talking about this. And Chris touched on this a little bit in our Trank Dope episode. You know, 150 people, those 150 deaths affect way more than just the individual dying because that every one of those people, like you said, they are mothers and cousins and aunts and uncles themselves, but they also have mothers and cousins and aunts and uncles and friends and other families. So when somebody's dying, it's not just affecting them as being the deceased. All of their family members are obviously impacted by that as well, too. So it, while 150 yep, it in the grand out. scheme of how many people live in this country, while 150 might seem small to some, you know, as bad as that might sound, it's way more than just 150 people that are affected by that. Yep, that's a great point. That is a great point. Well, um, the next question, we're going to go back to true or false. And this kind of has to do with, I almost spoiled it earlier, but um, this has to do with how fentanyl is made and where it's made. So true or false, most illicit fentanyl is made here in the United States. That is false. Correct. That is false. Most of it is so made. So for bonus points... Uh, Where? Most of it, most of it, um, I'm not sure if it's necessarily made there, but most of it is comes into the country through Mexico. Correct. And then the, there's one other country that that follows Mexico for a second bonus point for total of three. I will just because of their history with other illicit substances, I will say Colombia. No, China actually. Okay, it's a good guess okay. with you know because we get a lot of the uh, like cocaine and such from Colombia, I believe, but mm -hmm. uh, China. Okay. Um, so question. So you got an extra bonus point for that one. So you're at three right now. That makes up for you throwing that um, sneaky one of me out of the gate. <laughs> it it does. That's how I was like. I got to give him bonus ones, man, because that was that was pretty hateful. Especially you started out with that. Okay, this one's kind of a weird one, but I actually found it to be very interesting. Uh, so question four: When was fentanyl created? Uh, in the 1950s, the 1960s, the 70s, or the 80s? Just because it seems like most of our substances that are now deemed illegal were were invented during this time period, I'm going to say the 50s. You're right, 1959. I was surprised. Um, so over the in years, 1959. It... Go ahead. I was just say over over the years of my research, it just seems like a lot of the substances that today we consider to be mostly illegal substances, heroin and stuff like that, they all seem to have kind of come onto the scene. In those in in that time period of the fifties, some in the sixties too, as at the time, very much legal prescription substances, and then you know over the decades, as we've learned the harm that they can do, they've slowly become uh, phased out and become illegal. But sorry, I, I know I cut you off. Back to your yes. uh, follow up no, of the statistics. No, that was a good point. So I thought this was really interesting too because it's just it's such a prominent issue now and has been you know the opioid epidemic didn't really boom until the 90s um and early 2000s 
And so to know that this has been floating around since 1959, it looks like originally it was only used in operating rooms and on animals. Uh, but in the 90s, the fentanyl patch was made. Um, and that was during the whole like opioids are great and they were overprescribed. And, you know, that's again, an entire podcast could be dedicated to the opioid epidemic, how it happened, et cetera. Um, but for today, we'll shorten it by saying, yes, Dan is correct. 1959. So next question, number five, how much stronger is fentanyl compared to heroin? This is multiple choice. Is it three to five times stronger than heroin, 20 times, 50 times, or 100 times stronger than heroin? Okay, so see, this can be a tricky one, but I, I know this one. So it's 50 times stronger than heroin, and for extra bonus point, it's 100 times stronger than morphine. How did you know that was literally? Are you looking? Because I have that no, literally written. No. Like I was just trying to be point, hundred times stronger than morphine. You're I right. was just trying to be a little uh, smart aleck there and and throw that extra bonus one in for you, just to just to you know, hammer it home. <laughs> Shocking. So that's two but once again, for once Dan, again, but yeah, just to so, you know, once again, just because uh, I know some people might think, well, how do you know that? That's another one of those ones where you write about this stuff enough, and that's another one that's like. That's a jarring statistic. It's like you can't forget that no matter how yep. hard you try. I've memorized that too. I, yeah, I yeah. figured I figured that was one, but I, I still wanted to go over it because not everybody listening might know that. No, when no, I first course. learned that, I remember thinking like, like that's, that's insane. Like we think of, you know, morphine. Yes, we know there's stuff that's stronger. So that to me didn't blow my mind as much. But when, we, when I think of like, like, ooh, scary illicit drugs, heroin is like up there on that list of just wow i have this this perception and it you know accurate that it's it's very intense it's very potent it's very dangerous very addictive so to know that fentanyl is 50 times stronger than heroin like that's that's so much my brain can't fully process that that's but wild it, it's another reminder of just how dangerous and potentially deadly fentanyl can be even in the smallest smallest amount because think about it the just the tiniest amount of fentanyl is 50 times stronger than heroin excuse me and 100 times stronger than morphine and think about how common morphine is within hospitals for pre and post op during surgery or you yes. know for pain management and same thing in hospitals care. yeah oh, and so nice. you, but if you, anyone who's ever been given morphine in a hospital and you think about how loopy and kind of zonked out it makes you. Now, imagine how you felt on morphine and times that by 100. And that is what <laughs> right. fentanyl does, essentially. Right. And, you know, it is legal for very specific use. So the people that need it do truly very much need it. But the people that are abusing it are really, really putting themselves at risk because of that potency. Um, so kind of on that note, um, something I wanted to talk about, and this is a true or false, uh, true or false, you can overdose on fentanyl by touching it. Aha, uh -huh. that's a very, very I'm not good trying question. to be tricksy. No, no, no. That's a very good question because I think we'll I know. We'll just say touch it like, like yeah, this. That's a very good question because I think you, I know where you're going with this and this is a very important topic that we need to get into. So the answer to that one is false and I will let you explain how you came across that question because I think I know where you're going with this one. We just talked about this recently, I think. Yeah, yeah. So basically, there are some viral videos and some urban myths that are going around and go around every once in a while about and they're creeping into the news stream too, which is they're creeping yeah. into the news stream too, which is why this is so important that we're discussing this right now. Yes. So we did mention the fentanyl patch and. It is true that over a prolonged period of time, the body can absorb fentanyl through the skin. That's with the patch. That's over a period of, I'm going to say it's like 24 hours or, or possibly even more, but it is over a very long period of time. However, it is not easy to absorb fentanyl through the skin at all, uh, especially if it's just in pill form or any of the other forms it comes in. So... One of the myths that is extremely pervasive is that if there is a fentanyl user, um, uh, usually, you know, an addict or somebody using it illegally, 
And if it is on dollar bills or if it's on doorknobs or any you, just a regular person, go and touch that thing that, oh, no, you suddenly are, are having an overdose because you've touched something that, that got fentanyl on. It. And that is 100% false. So you can breathe easy. You, you can't get it from contaminated money or anything like that. It cannot hurt you. It cannot be absorbed that way. On that note, and I want to be very careful about how I address this because I don't want to poop on anyone either. There are some viral videos. A relative even sent me one to ask because they know I, I, you know, am in this industry. And they were like, how true is this? Is this something to be worried about? It shows um, the particular one that they sent shows an officer who appeared to be having a very physical reaction to coming into physical contact with fentanyl. And you know, all of that particular situation aside, because I don't, again, I don't want to get into anything controversial or poop on that particular person or whatever, but it is not possible for fentanyl to be absorbed through the skin in that way. Even if you have a cut or something like that, it's just, it doesn't work that way. If it did, these addicts wouldn't be out here chewing on the patches or scraping them and, and injecting them. Um, people in who work in hospitals would have you know, we've been hearing way more stories about, oh, no, I accidentally touched this. And, you know, this nurse had an OD and you would be hearing it a lot more. So that being said, there are protocols and such for first responders because you do want to be cautious. You know, it, it couldn't hurt to be cautious. But this fear that if you just simply your skin comes into contact with a type of fentanyl for just very briefly that you could you could suddenly pass out and have this overdose experience it just doesn't work that way so um again i don't want to say anything poor about this officer or any other videos that you've seen or, or suggest that they were fake a lot of experts have weighed in and said it's very possible that that was a, a psychosomatic response um that is potentially the result of a lot of this false information that floats around and this, this idea that, oh my gosh, if I touch this extremely dangerous thing, it could kill me. And sometimes our bodies, you know, talking about mental health, sometimes our bodies just take over and go into complete panic mode. And so, you know, that could be a contributing factor in some of these videos that have gone around of people having these extreme reactions. I don't know. I'm not trying to say one way or another what's accurate. That's just what some of the experts have posed as a possibility. So again, Sentinel is not easy to absorb through the skin like that. So it's not going to harm you in that way. Not that easily. You actually have to ingest it. Absolutely. And, and I think this is an important topic that we touch on because it's one thing, and I don't mean, once again, I'm going to be careful in the way I, I word this. It's one thing when these videos make their rounds on TikTok or Instagram or Twitter or social media platforms where... Things can go viral that might not necessarily be true and people might kind of just go off of them. And, and, and people whatnot. know that. Yeah. But they expect when, these that. Stories, when these stories start creeping into and making their way into the mainstream media news stream, where if you're watching the local news at night and you see a story or, you know, whatever cable news outlet you, you watch, whether it's Fox News or CNN or, or any of the other ones, and they're doing stories major stories in prime time or even throughout the day on videos that surface such as this, uh, people tend to, I don't want to say take it more seriously if they see it in the mainstream media news stream, but they, it tends to catch their attention They're less more. likely to question it. Yeah. I feel like. If it's a video you know, that they're, they're less scrolling. Likely, if you see it on TikTok, right. If you're, you're scrolling like, on TikTok eh. or Instagram or Twitter and you happen to come across the video, Maybe you watch it for a second. You might not even watch it. You, you know, you might just be like, okay, let me just keep scrolling to find the cat video that I want to see or, you know, read about what right. my friends. You go you to know, comment so. section and everyone's like, fake. yeah, yeah. You know, but once like, it's fake, fake, fake. Once the mainstream news media starts reporting on it, then it's like, okay, well, maybe this is something more legitimate that I need to, you know, keep learn about. So I think it's very, very important that, I don't want to say we debunk it, but that we bring to everyone's attention that it's not quite that cut and dry as far as what you see in the videos and what ultimately ends up happening. Right. The The key to education and the key, well, the key to safety really is accurate education. And so, you know, we're not saying like, 
oh, fentanyl's no big deal. Like, you know, play around with it, fill bottles with it, like make a make one of those sand turner thingies, hourglass, whatever it's called, sand turner. You know, make it with fentanyl. Like, no, we're not saying that. We're just, it's good to be cautious and smart about things that are accurate and correct. So, Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay, so on that note, Sam Turner, my God. The, the visual um, of the thing. That's question like, seven. That's just... <laughs> I mean, it's it's true, right? It's a Sam. No, no, it is. It is. It is. Know. It's just... Yeah. <laughs> the places our minds take us on this show sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, <laughs> question seven, moving yeah. on. Next question. Because the sand turner is turning. Um, what percentage of fake pills tested by the DEA? So these are the DEA will confiscate these pills that they've they've, you know, these these drug dealers and stuff have have pressed to look like oxys or fentanyl or whatever. What percentage of them contained a lethal dose of fentanyl? More than 20%? More than 30%, more than 40%, or more than half? More than 40%. Yes. Do you know for bonus points exactly the number? Is this another one that you have memorized? So, yeah. I just, I, I know it was more than 40%. Once again, it's another one of those where when you come across it, it's like, wow, you can't really forget that one. Right. I, I want to say it's either 43% or 47%. And I can't, I feel like either one of those is the right one, but I can't my finger on which one it may be so the source i found said 42 percent, but i'm 42? gonna give it to okay. you because that's close enough and it might be <laughs> like that it's 42.7 and they rounded down for the article and you know whatever um so when we talk about fake pills again this is drug dealers in these clandestine labs and they're making pills that look like oxys and um you know other opiate and benzos even that also contain fentanyl because again fentanyl is so cheap why would you take this much of something to make something when you can only take this much of something you know what i mean does that i hope that visual makes a little bit more sense for people so for the listening audience only better the first money making strategy for them i would say for the listening audience only for those that may not be watching the first gesture just made was oh, a very I, large size and then the next one was like a minuscule like size of a piece of sand so tiny. just to put that visual in your head for reference for our non- for our listening only audience. So sorry, continue. No, smart. Um, I forget that this is also like <laughs> a, an actual podcast. Um, so it's cheaper for them to add fentanyl into these pills versus, you know, these other opiate. And so of those pills that just the ones that have been confiscated by the DEA, more than 40%, 42% of them had a lethal dose of fentanyl in one pill. That's crazy because that essentially means that if you are buying these manufactured pills on the street, you almost have a 50-50 chance of one of the pills you buy being lethal. Like when you break it down to right. just the basics and of that, think about that one for a minute. Yeah, yeah. Think about that one for a minute. You basically, if you buy because a pill, one pill, you have a 50-50 chance of that one pill being lethal. And that's for people... That's a single pill, you know, and I don't know about you, but but a lot of people who have developed uh, drug addiction issues are typically, you know, you develop, we talked about this in the last podcast, you develop tolerance and dependence. And so chances are they're going to be taking more than one to begin with in a sitting. And if only one contains a lethal dose, I mean, just think about it. That's already astronomically more dangerous and I mean, mind blowing. realistically, I, I don't know anyone who, I shouldn't say I don't know anyone because I don't actually know anyone, but metaphorically speaking, I don't know anyone who is going and buying illicit substances on the street and going and saying, I would like just one pill, please. No, they're buying <laughs> batches of pills. So I'd it's like, like to be very careful. Yeah. So, and once again, I'm not trying to make light or make fun of, of people and their, and what they're doing, but I, you're not you you're gonna go buy even if it's a small baggie, you're going to be buying multiple pills at once. You're not just going and saying, I will you know, just give me one pill. So the more pills that you right. obviously have, the greater the odds that at least one of those in those batch of pills is going to be lethal. Yep. Dang. It's like a really horrible pinata. You know, when you think about the odds of like, you know, in that one bag, like one of those things. And it, 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 it being 42% or 43%, I mean, if you, in, in that bag, 
the odds it's the it's the odds of at least one being i mean at that point the obviously the more pills you have the more the greater the you know the the more that could it potentially be so we're we're talking at least one out of a batch so in in, right. in reality Ooh. all right um well we've reached the last question and this is true or false um and this is kind of goes back to what we were talking about about you know fentanyl and things being in the news and this is something that gets talked about every october True or false, fentanyl is being added to Halloween candy to get kids hooked on drugs. That is false. Trust is. me, that is very, very false. Why is it very false, Dan? Well, once again, not to make light of the situation, but just think about it on the most basic... Um, just think about it from the most basic perspective. If you were a drug dealer and you made your living selling drugs to people, would you then just essentially start giving them away in hopes that maybe somebody will then come to you at a future time to buy more? And I feel like but the answer to that is a resounding card. no. Yeah, exactly. Correct. So, so last time I checked, I drug dealers don't tend this. to give their products away for free. That's all I'm saying. They don't. It's not like, you know, in the mall where you're walking by and it's always the like the lotion per person that's like, you know, you want to try this? You want to try this? So let's talk about this because every Halloween there is something that comes out about like check your Halloween candy. Uh, and it's, you know, it's an urban legend, first of all. Um, the hollow. So there is something called Rainbow Fentanyl. We do actually have a page on the website about it uh, if you want to read more about it. It is basically sentinel pills that have been illicitly manufactured that they come in a lot of bright colors. And the DEA put out a suggestion or the, a theory, um, an official theory, that they suspect drug dealers are trying to target young people with these brightly colored candy looking pills. Now, when you hear young people, that that's a broad term and that is a large umbrella. And unfortunately, I think what happened is there was the Halloween candy urban legends that goes around every, you know, few years. It's a different drug. You know, usually it's weed candies. Now it's it's rainbow fentanyl that they're talking about. Plus, the existence of rainbow fentanyl made a lot of people freak out and say, oh, my gosh, these drug dealers are giving our kids these candy looking fentanyl things. Um, so Dr. Joel Best, he's a professor of uh, criminology and criminal justice at the University of Delaware, has done extensive research on this subject, has studied it at length for decades, and has never found a single kid getting harmed by Halloween candy after decades, I think since the 80s of research. So it's important, again, to to look at the fact and not buy into these these myths that are fear based. Um, like Dan said, you know, drug dealers are not, like they're not giving away stuff for free in the hopes of getting kids, especially trick or treating age. I mean, I trick or treated until I was like 11 or 12. And I think that was even a little old, you know, for for what's generally um, I, like what kids generally do. The amount of money so most kids are get getting. Yeah, the amount of money most kids are making off their allowance every week is not going to be enough for them to go out and start buying, you know, these fentanyl. Pills. no. There's no profit in it. There's no reason to do it. I mean, they don't want like seven and eight year olds hooked on fentanyl. Like, A, that would kill them anyway. But B, that's, that is not, again, not to make light of something kind of horrifying, but it's not beneficial from a business perspective. And that's what the drug deal is. It's a business, unfortunately. I, I, I think for the most so, part, I think for the most part, and obviously there are exceptions aside of to just life, but I think for the most part, the biggest danger that a child has when it comes to Halloween candy is eating too much of it and getting a stomach. Ache. And I mean, yes. re realistically, at the end of the day, <laughs> I it. think that's the biggest, uh, yeah, right. I think that's the biggest um, concern as far as uh, parents go is making sure their kids don't get sick from eating too much, not because of what it may or may not be laced with. Correct. That's right. Um, all right. So that's the end of our quiz. Let me tally up your points real quick. What? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You got a total of ten, Dan. And that was out of a you total got, of actually, possibly got, twelve, right? 
Yes, because there was one, uh, the first question, which was kind of mean, was a zero. (laughs) And then there was one that I gave the opportunity for like two bonuses. You got one of the two. Yeah, I didn't didn't get China. So I guess that's right. So honestly, well done. You know your stuff. You're well-educated, not, you know, hyped up on on the fear-mongering and the myths about fentanyl. Uh, So good job. I'm very proud of you. So yeah, anyone that got an 11 or a 12 out of 12, please let me know. Um, even if you didn't, let us we know anyway. Know. Yeah, let, I mean, regardless of what score you got, if you want to share it with us, that's great. But especially those of you that scored above a 10, um, yeah, we want to know. Please let us know um, how you did on that, that one as well. And uh, maybe we'll share some of your guys' scores uh, in next week's episode. Or comments, you know, or like yeah, if there was a particular one that you were like, wow, I was really shocked by this. We were probably all shocked by the first one, let's be real. Or but... honestly, if you have additional questions from some of the like yeah. follow-up questions from some of the questions that just asked as well, too, please, uh, once again, I, like I said, I know I said it earlier, I really enjoyed doing that Q&A this week, so I hope that we can do some more of those Q&A segments going forward, which uh, we can do with the help of our audience uh, providing us questions to be answered. But on that note, this will that'll do it for this particular week's episode. Um, so thank you to Jess, as always, for joining me and being my co-host. Even when she throws in those sneaky, sneaky questions right out of the gate, she clearly has not heard of easing into to tests. So, you know, it's it, it must nope. be the teacher in her that she's like, I'm just going to give you a hard one right out Honestly, of the gate and get you shook. No, as a, as a former teacher, I would never actually do that to my students on a test. <laughs> oh, so you just do it to me, like, so I appreciate it. Thank them. You. Just Dan, just Dan. Just to me. I cool, knew you cool. could handle it. I knew. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, <laughs> well, on that, since, since I'm so honored by the fact that you did it to just me, uh, if you liked what you heard today, be sure to subscribe to our podcast feed, wherever you do get your podcasts. And while you're there, please rate review. And like we said earlier, leave notes, leave questions. Tell us how you did on today's quiz. Uh, we'll, we'd love to hear your feedback as always. So, and of course, too, as always, as a reminder, as we've talked about fentanyl today and ways that you can get help, if you or a loved one is struggling with not just fentanyl, but any substance of abuse, uh, whether it be alcohol, opioids, really anything, any substance of abuse, any behavioral addictions, mental health struggles, uh, help is always available. You know, we mentioned earlier, but once again, you can't get help if you're not alive. So please obviously be careful. Um, if you do feel like you have to use, please obviously be careful doing so. Uh, when the time comes that you do want to get help and find treatment, findtreatment.gov is a great place to find treatment options in your area. Uh, The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration also has a toll-free helpline that you can call to also get options for places in your area where you can get help. And that phone number is 1-800-662-4357. Once again, that's 1-800-662-4357. And of course, addictionhelp.com, where Jess is doing an amazing job and you can read all her great work there, whether it's about rainbow fentanyl, whether it's about opioids, really anything, anything involving mental health, uh, substance abuse, addiction, dependence. Uh, she's just doing a bang up job there as far as providing excellent resources and ways that you can also get help as well. So go ahead. And I check do out use better work. words than Sand Turner on the website. There so. you go. Yes, yes. A little more. We get a little. She gets a little more technical in her writing on the website. So. <laughs> That's important to note as well. But uh, that will do it for today's show. Thank you all for taking the time to listen or watch to our show today. And we will talk to you guys next week. Have a great week, everyone.